Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the new Sounds True Foundation. The Sounds True Foundation is dedicated to creating a wiser and kinder world by making transformational education widely available. We want everyone to have access to transformational tools such as mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion, regardless of financial, social, or physical challenges. The Sounds True Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to providing these transformational tools to communities in need, including at-risk youth, prisoners, veterans, and those in developing countries. If you'd like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Deb Dana. Deb is a clinician and consultant specializing in using the lens of polyvagal theory to understand and resolve the impact of trauma and create ways of working that honor the role of the autonomic nervous system She's a founding member of the Polyvagal Institute and with Sounds True has created an audio learning series on befriending your nervous system. And she's also written a new book called Anchored, How to Befriend Your Nervous System Using Polyvagal Theory. Deb Dana is also a featured presenter in Sounds True's new Healing Trauma Certificate Program, a nine month training to regulate your nervous system embody safety, and become a healing presence. You can learn more at SoundsTrue.com. Deb Dana works closely with Dr. Stephen Porges, who is the researcher who first articulated polyvagal theory. I have to say, it's not an easy theory for a layperson like me from the outside to understand, but Deb has a gift not just for translating the theory so that people can understand it regardless of whether or not you're a therapist or helping professional, but also helping us see how we can actually become active operators of our nervous system. So we understand the theory and then we take it a step further. We learn how to actually work with ourselves to return to a place of what's called ventral regulation. You're going to learn a lot more where we can become a healing resource for others. Here's my conversation with Deb Dana. You have a gift, Deb, for doing something that I think is really hard, which is translating polyvagal theory for people who haven't studied it, who are unfamiliar with it, who aren't professional therapists. So let's start there. Give our listeners an everyday layperson's introduction to polyvagal theory. All right, let's let's give this a try, and and I appreciate your your kind words because it is what I what I love doing. I love sort of talking about the nervous system in just everyday language. So, you know, if we talk about the three states of our nervous system, we have dorsal, sympathetic, and ventral. And so those three terms are terms that I you know hope everybody will will begin to use. And so dorsal is the place when it's in its survival energy. It's that place where we feel sort of not really here, kind of going through the motions, but we don't have a lot of energy to really care about it. I like to think we sort of disappear in some way, sort of take a step back. I'm not really here. That's a dorsal experience. It's your nervous system acting to keep you safe by taking you out of connection into some sort of of collapse or shutdown. And then we have sympathetic, you know, which in its survival energy is pretty well known as fight and flight, right? It brings that, those two parallel pathways of anger and anxiety, right? And, and, and it's acting to serve your survival by taking you into a, a, a anxiety or an anger. And then we have ventral, the third, which is the, the place that brings us into 
connection, communication, regulation, um, social engagement, right? That, that's the, the system that, that you and I are, are bringing alive right now as we're doing this, this conversation together. God right? willing. And it, God willing. <laughs> and so, you know, and it's our ventral um, e- experience that really helps us do this, right? And so if you, if you, you know, slip out of ventral and have a moment of, of feeling, you know, sort of a rise of that um, survival energy, either the fight, flight, or the disappear, you know, hopefully my ventral will be strong enough to hold the two of us. And then if that shifts and I have a moment of feeling, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing here, your ventral can be strong enough to hold the two of us. And that's the beauty of nervous systems, right? That, that, that you know, they, we go back and forth. We, we support each other through this ventral energy, which, which I think is a lovely thing to think about. Your biology, right, is, is, is helping you show up and, and support another human being. And then help me understand the role of the vagus nerve in these three different nervous system states. Sure. So so the vagus nerve is what brings ventral and dorsal alive. And so your autonomic nervous system is made up of the vagus nerve with ventral and dorsal and the sympathetic nervous system. So we have these three components that come together to make up the autonomic nervous system. And it's really the the ventral vagus that we're talking about all the time now as as the the key to um, regulation, the key to feeling safe and organized and able to meet the challenges of the day with some sort of equanimity and ease. And how much control do each of us have over our nervous system? And how much is it just, you know, it's called the the autonomic nervous system. It's just kind of doing its thing. How much control do we actually have? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think we're, we're beginning to discover more and more actually how much control we do have over, how much we can, you know, work with. You know, our nervous system can become our ally and we can work with it. We can partner with it. You know, it, it is automatic, right? Thank goodness. It it runs breath, heart rate, digestion, all these things without us having to think about it. Thank goodness. Because if I had to think about every breath or every heartbeat, I would have no energy or room to do anything else. So it does that in the background. And we're learning that we can begin to shape our system so that we have more access to this beautiful ventral regulating energy. And that if we do certain practices, our baseline of ventral, the, the place that, that we rest, our set point, can actually be elevated. We can, we can have more, you know, but by doing very simple things to, to, to bring it alive over and over and over. So um, it, it's, it's a fascinating time to, to be working with the nervous system. And, and one of my goals is to help people become active operators of their own nervous systems, because I think, uh, um, You know, it's, I like to think it's sort of the vehicle we're driving through life, so we should know how it runs. And when we know how it works, we can work with it and we can begin to shape it. And, And I think if we think about that, that's an incredibly hopeful message, right? That we can shape our system toward more um, regulation, toward more ability to feel safe in connection, to, to move through the world um, in a different way. And the, and the biology, the research tells us that this is in fact true. We are not stuck in the patterns that we're in right now. We can change those patterns. Now, it's interesting you use this word shape. We can shape our nervous system. Why the word shape? You could say influence, change, impact, transform. I know. There's so many words, aren't there? And again, it's it's sort of personal preference, I guess. But for me, shape is 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 kind of what we're always doing because... The nervous system is is being shaped by every experience we have, by our experiences with others in the world, by, by you know what it feels like inside. So moment to moment, or actually micro moment to micro moment, um, our nervous system, which I think of as a relational system, I'm not sure that's scientifically correct, but it feels like a relational system to me, is being shaped. You know, it is being impacted, it's being influenced, all those things. But for me, there's this gentle shaping that happens rather than a than a big reorganization. There's this gentle shaping that's going on all the time. 
which again for me feels feels incredibly hopeful. You know that as we go through our day, every experience we're having it, it is is helping to shape us in in a in some way. Mm -hmm. Now, this notion of becoming an active operator of our nervous system, I absolutely love that idea. But I notice that like, it's like using heavy machinery or something, know how it operates. I'm not sure I'm trained yet. So I want to understand more. When you talk about these three nervous system states, I actually think I have a pretty good sense. And I think our audience might as well about the dorsal inactivity, like, you know, I'm a lump. You know, something happened and I'm going to throw the covers over my head, freeze and be a lump, super lump. I think I get that. I think I get fight or flight too. That's pretty intuitive. But then I'm left with, am I actually, to use the word that the title of your book is, anchored, am I actually anchored in ventral or am I just not in fight or flight or in action? How do I know? How, what, what's the litmus test for that? Yeah. Well, all right. So let's think about this because ventral is the essential ingredient um, in, in the nervous system that helps us feel um, ready to engage, to feel, you know, regulated, to feel able to connect and communicate from a place of, of, you know, welcoming. We, 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 we feel welcomed by others and we welcome others in when we're in this place of, of ventral energy. When ventral energy is, is alive and active and, um, and, um, holding us when we're anchored in ventral, it simply means that there's more ventral active and alive in my system than sympathetic or dorsal, right? If, if, if the balance shifts and I go to sympathetic or dorsal, I lose access to all of those wonderful qualities of ventral. I now am in survival, either fight, flight, or I like your lump, <laughs> fight, flight, or a lump. And when I'm in those places, I have no access to connection and communication and, and welcome and, and regulation because the nervous system can't do both. It's an either or in this place, which is why we say anchoring in ventral. You know when you're anchored in ventral because you feel there's a sense of, of safety and, and everybody has their own word for safety, but I like safety, safe enough to, to venture out into the world, right? I'm organized enough. You know, I'm, 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 I'm ready enough. It's not, I don't have to be fully like, oh my God, wonderful, beautiful day. It can be that, but it simply can be that, oh yeah, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to enter into this day and, and, and see what happens. I feel, I feel ready. That's a ventral experience. And so yes, anchored in ventral simply means that, that um, I, I have enough of that flowing through my system to keep the survival energies um, in the background. Okay, so what you're saying is I could have this like welcoming, ready to engage others in the world state, and I could feel really angry at someone and kind of like I want to have an argument somewhere, but maybe that's only 15% of me. And I could talk about it even and reflect on it and connect with another person while I reflect. Honest. See, that's, that's the gift of ventral, of having an anchor in ventral. It means you can then um, feel that anger in another person, and you can, those words you said, talk about it, reflect about it, you know, be with it instead of being hijacked into that anger and acting from that place. And ventral allows you to do that. Ventral, an anchor in ventral allows you to, to be with those other experiences in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned in the book Anchored that it's important for people to be introduced to these terms, dorsal, sympathetic, and vagal. But then you say, go ahead and create your own words for these states, make it real. And I thought that was a great kind of opening exercise because you have to really understand it to make it real. Yes. And uh, I'm willing to share with you the three words I came up with. But before I do, before I do, I'd love to know what your three words are and maybe some other three words from people you've worked with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's, it, it's interesting words that common words that come up for, for the three states um, are often um, energetic words or, or weather words, believe it or not. So sunny, stormy, foggy. 
ventral sympathetic dorsal. Dorsal for me has, has a, a sense of, of um, deep, dark um, hole. Right. So that that it has that flavor for me of, of um, I had a, a client who said she went down the dorsal drain. You know, it's that sense of being just sucked down into something, a blackness that that she can't see anything, feel anything lost. So, you know, for me, um, dorsal is usually lost. Sympathetic is is. Um, um, you know, w one of the words that, that I, I use is chaotic, but that's less descriptive than recently I've been using crazy making, right? It's this crazy making place. And, and ventral for me is, is nourishing. That, you know, nourish is a word I love. And so I love bringing, bringing that one to light. So what are yours? I had for ventral, I had safe. Mm -hmm. For sympathetic, I had go-go. Yeah. And then for dorsal, I had stop. But that oh, was nice. just, that was, mine were like movement words, but I, yeah. it's interesting yeah. that you use weather. Now, one of the things you write about in Anchored is how for you, ventral vagal as a state is it like a colorful umbrella yeah. that yeah. holds our sympathetic and dorsal. And I wanted to understand more about that, the image of the colorful umbrella. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, when, when that umbrella is open, and I love beautiful colored umbrellas. It's colorful, it's rainbow colored. And when it's open, you know, and you're underneath it. So imagine you're underneath this beautifully colorful big umbrella and it's pouring out. And you're 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 dry, you're warm, you're safe under this umbrella. So for me, when ventrals open, sympathetic and dorsal are under the umbrella. And because of that, they're doing their everyday roles. They're not doing their survival roles. So their everyday roles, di um, dorsal's everyday role is to bring you healthy digestion, to bring you nutrients, to nourish you. And sympathetic's job is to help regulate your heart and breath rhythms and bring you movement to help you move through the day. And so when they're under the umbrella of a ventral, safe and protected and warm and dry, they can do those roles. Right. And then you think what happens, you know, the one I love is when the umbrella blows inside out. Right. Too much wind blows inside out. And then, you know, sympathetic. That's sympathetic to me. Sympathetic is now running the show because ventral's gone. Umbrella's inside out. Ventral's gone. Sympathetic fight flight. And you can feel that in the inside out umbrella or when the umbrella is fully collapsed. It's to shut down, right? Again, that's dorsal. That's that lump place that down crashed. So for me, the umbrella was, was an image that I love. And again, I invite people to come up with their own image. And the only thing it has to be is, is something that, that can, can really um, illustrate ventral as holding sympathetic and dorsal so that they don't have to be in their survival roles. Right. Now, it's interesting because there's a way that, you know, when I first started being introduced to this language, there was a feeling of like fight or flight, that's not where I want to be, and inaction, that's not where I want to be. But yet you're saying these have powerful, important everyday roles that we need that are just part of having a healthy nervous system that's operating. So how do we make the distinction between this is an everyday role and oh, now we're in the survival protective place? Yeah, and, and um, you know, we if we bring in one more term, we can do that. We bring in neuroception, which is also in the book. There, there are very few terms in the book that that I really, you know, wanted to hold on to. Um, ventral, sympathetic, dorsal, hierarchy, and neuroception, I think, are the ones that I that I really fought for because I do believe that that I hope they become everyday family language is really what I hope. So, you know, but neuroception is your nervous system's way of taking in information and making a judgment about safety or unsafety, right? And so if your neuroception is one of safety, then you know you're, you're anchored in ventral. If your neuroception is one of unsafety, then it's going to bring a survival response. So I can, in ventral, I can be frustrated, I can be worried, and still, you know, have a neuroception, oh, but I'm safe enough to figure this out, to, 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 to you know, handle this. 
And then when I move beyond worry into anxiety, for me, that's my demarcation, worry to anxiety, anxiety, then feel, I feel endangered. And that's a sympathetic survival um, energy. So everybody's going to sort of come up with their own um, understanding of when is that switch made, right? Um, so neuroception is one way of, of, of doing that. And neuroception is, is a biological process that we don't directly connect with, but we feel the, the, the outcome of it. You, we feel when our, when something happens inside, we have a, 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 a tension or a stomach ache or a, or a, or a headache or something that's, that's neuroception sending messages. Or when, um, when the, uh, connection with another person feels like, ooh, something doesn't feel right here, right? That's your neuroception giving you a message, hmm, something, right? Or the environment. You walk through an environment and you feel, ooh, I'm not comfortable here. That's your neuroception. That's the, isn't that a wonderful, wise nervous system that sends you those cues without the language that your brain uses? So again, we have to figure out how to decode that and how to speak the nervous system's language. And that's really what a lot of the exercises in the book are about, getting to know your own nervous system and how, how it speaks to you. Mm -hmm. So let's say someone says, okay, I can relate to an experience of being with someone. And during the experience, nothing too terrible happened. But afterwards, I felt off, like somehow things weren't okay. I wasn't okay. It felt dangerous. This doesn't feel very good. How do I work as an intelligent operator of my nervous system to get back to a sense of safety after I receive those kinds of signals? Right. So you're getting those signals from your nervous system. And what we want to do is we want to then um, bring them into explicit awareness. And we want to begin to reflect on the experience and notice, huh, I wonder what it was. What were some of the, the, the things that happened that sent me this flavor of danger? And so we go back and we, we sort of reflect on it and review it. And we begin to get good at noticing, oh, maybe, maybe it was, maybe it was a certain movement the person did. Maybe it was a tone of voice. Maybe it was a word. We all have these certain things that, that for us are based in our history and bring a neuroception of unsafety to us, a certain look, a word, a, a way of moving, um, a feeling as though, oh, I was dismissed. I wasn't really listened to. I gave more than I received any of these things. And what we want to do is we want to go back when we can have a bit of distance from it. So when you were talking and you're saying, oh, it felt like something was, was not quite right and, and it felt a little dangerous, even as you were talking, that felt like it came from a place of, of a bit of curiosity about it, right? And when we have curiosity, curiosity is a quality of, of ventral. So when you're curious about something, you know that your ventral is there and can help lead the way to exploring, to going back and reviewing, right? If you, if you were just thinking, oh my God, that was horrible and it felt really dangerous and get me out of here. There's no curiosity there. You can't hear any curiosity in my, my voice or, or my words. You know, oh, there's no ventral there. So that's a survival energy. Just get out of here, get, get away. And then when you have time to, to come back and have some curiosity, then you can reflect on it. But if we don't have curiosity, if we don't have that, you know, some ventral there, we can't reflect, right? Our biology won't allow us. It's not that we don't want to, but our biology won't allow us to reflect until we have enough ventral to allow that curiosity and the ability to look back and, and, and explore. Yeah. Okay. So let's say someone says, I need to know some tips to bring ventral back now. Bring <laughs> ventral online now. I need it. What can you suggest? I love it because even even the even the statement I need it now is is a it, you know is a is a is a nervous system saying help, right? And one of the things I love about this way of of looking is that everything that happens is the nervous system trying to tell us something. So in that way, I need it now. The nervous system was saying, help. I, I'm, I'm feeling at sea. I, I, need, I need my anchor to come back to ventral. You know, and we each are going to have our own specific ways of doing that, the things we're drawn to. Um, I'm drawn um, probably to, to um, I often put, put a hand on my heart. 
you know, or two hands on my heart, and it just reminds me, oh, yes, I'm here, and I can feel my heartbeat, and then I can feel it slow down a bit. For me, that's a pretty reliable one. Um, for other people, um, there's there's movement. Movement will usually bring you back into some organization, right? So going for a walk, getting out in nature, um, turning on a piece of music, um, um, certain ways of breathing. You may have a, you may have a statement that, that brings you there. You know, that, that reminder. I, what I like to say is that we're always reminding our nervous system it knows how to return to ventral. I truly believe that. I, I, I call it our home. We all have a home in ventral. And the nervous system knows how to bring us home. And so we just have to, to kind of partner with our nervous system to say, well, what are some, some easy ways to begin to come home. And what I encourage people to do is write down four or five things on a card somewhere so you have a menu. Because sometimes, you know, hand on heart for me may work, may not work. And then it may be the statement, right? You know, the reminder, oh, yes, I have an anchor in ventral. I can reach for that anchor, you know, and you can't see me, but I usually reach, I, I extend my arm reaching for my anchor, right? So, you know, lots of different ways. What would you do? What would be a way that you would? Well, in in reading your book, Anchored, and in trying to become more knowledgeable about returning to ventral, what came up for me were a couple of images of everyday real experiences I have in my life when I definitely feel anchored in connection. So I was like, this is a for sure one. So one of them is petting the belly of one of our two dogs and just having like real time petting their warm and silky belly. That's like a surefire one. And God, I'm telling more about myself than I had intended. But uh, the other is hugging with my wife and having like real good huggy time. So uh, those are two instances where I, if I invoke those images and stick with them for a little while, I can feel myself returning to feeling mammalian connection. And the lovely thing about that, about your images, is that they, they are experiences your nervous system has already wired in. So they're not things that you're making up. They're experiences that are in there, wired in, and the image brings them back to life and lights up your ventral in that way again. That's the part I love about our nervous systems. They wire in these experiences, and they're just waiting for us to, to bring them back to life. I love, and I love both those images. They're beautiful. Yeah. Now, one of the techniques you offer in Anchored is this notion that we can find moments like that and we can quote unquote savor them and i wonder mm -hmm. if you can talk more about that and maybe give yeah. people some instructions on how they can find their own moments yeah. to savor yeah so so a moment to savor i mean your, yours were beautiful yours were, were sort of you know expansive moments which are lovely when, when i begin to look for a moment to savor i'm just looking for a micro moment just a small moment that felt like oh there, there was a spark of ventral there Right. And so it's something that happens in over the course of your daily, daily life. Like, you know, for for me, you know, I think our, our pets are going to make an appearance today. So for me, I had this moment when when my cat, you know, I was trying to work today and, and I was really feeling frustrated and, and my cat just jumped up on my lap right in the right between me and the computer it was like no you can't do this right now you know and it was this moment and I thought well I'm going to savor this right and so savoring is taking a moment and just sitting with it for 10 to 20 seconds it's a very short practice you know up to 30 seconds to the most you know most people do 10 to 20 seconds of just holding it in your experience right so feeling what it feels like you know so i closed my eyes could feel my cat i saw the image of my cat right there with me 20 seconds and what it does is it takes that moment of ventral and it and it marks it in a different way Right, because it could be, you know, it could just, you know, cat jumps up, you know, you, you say hi, you move them on, and you're done. You don't get the same benefit that way. So look for a micro moment. So everybody who's listening, you know, to us right now, if they want to look for a micro moment where they felt just this this momentary sense of okayness. It's all it needs to be, okayness. It doesn't have to be joy, wonder, awe, just okayness. And then hold that in their active awareness for 20 seconds, 
right? And that 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 does something very different with that experience. It 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 wires it in in a different way. And and the moments once you learn to savor, then you can be on the lookout for moments to savor. And every time you savor, you're beginning to to help your nervous system feel more of that ventral, and that will begin to build up. So as you savor, you're you're you are shaping, right? Savoring is a way of shaping. It's a it's a sweet. And what I love about it is that it's so so quick, ten to twenty seconds, right? And even that may be challenging for people because we have this sense, many of us, that oh, you know, if I if I you know, really celebrate something, something good, something bad will happen, or I don't deserve it, or I shouldn't, or all those things. You know, so what I like to tell people is, you know, try for 10 seconds. And if 10 feels good, go for 20. And if 20 feels good, go for 30, but then stop. It's no more than 30 seconds, because if you do more than that, it becomes some different practice. Savoring is, is up to 30 seconds. And if 10 is too much, that's okay, do five. Right, you're going to build your capacity to savor, and I will self-disclose for <laughs> for everybody. I can get between 18 and 20 seconds. That's my limit. That's where I get to, and I've after all these years of savoring, I've decided it's just what my nervous system says. 18 to 20 seconds is good. So okay. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, now, Deb, given this conversation we've had so far about these nervous system states and neuroception. What does it mean to have a regulated nervous system? What does that mean? Yeah, so a regulated nervous system uh, for me is a, is a nervous system that has flexibility so that um, we're not always um, anchored in that ventral state. None of us are. That, that's an unachievable um, experience. We, we move in and out all the time. But a regulated system is a flexible system, is a resilient system. And to me, that means um, I, can, I can notice when I leave ventral regulation. I can notice when I leave that place and enter into one of the survival energies and I can find my way home. I can find my way back because it's not the leaving that's the problem. That doesn't cause me um, to suffer physically and psychologically. It's leaving and getting stuck in a survival state and not being able to come back to ventral that causes the distress, the suffering. So for me, a regulated system, you know, just allows me to, to move out and come back and to notice, to know where I am and, 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 you know, to, to have the, the capacity to, to, um, you know, dysregulate and regulate again, I suppose, is what we're really talking about. And, and a regulated system, um, you know, is one way of describing that. That's, that's, you know, that I think is, is, is my goal, right? Not to, not to, and, and, you know, we need our survival states, right? We need them. There are times when survival is exactly what is needed, right? So, so we, we want to honor our survival states. We want to celebrate those as well. And, I want to know that, that, you know, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, when life has gotten too much and I go into that sympathetic anxiety, that I can find my way back to ventral. Because in sympathetic anxiety, I can't do anything about the problem. I can just swim in it. I'm stuck in it. But if I come back to ventral, then from that place, I can reflect and go, oh, what could I do? What are some of the options so that I can, you know, rearrange that? And to me, that only comes from a regulated nervous system. And are there times, even knowing everything you know, where you would make a statement like, God, I feel really dysregulated right now. And if so, what would be going on that you would make a statement like that? And then what would you do? Yes, and and yes, I make those statements all the time, all the time, because I think, and I think we all do. We are all a work in progress. Um, for me, um, I'm learning all the time. Um, I, you know, like everybody, bump into my own beliefs, you know, and and where my beliefs take me. I have a sympathetic um, energy that that has me saying yes to too many things. And then I, I bump up against that. I was, you know, messaging a friend this week and I said, I feel like I'm one step ahead of the speeding train, right? And that, that feels very scary, uncomfortable, anxiety provoking, and, and I need to do something about it. But when I'm just feeling that, I can't. So when I can, you know, then I have to say it out loud, 
say it to somebody who I trust and who's not going to give me back any, any suggestions because that's not what I'm needing. I just need to know, oh, yes, message received. Hear as you need. And then from that place, I can begin to feel, oh, I can come back into some, some sense of regulation so that I can do something about that. So that's one that happens to me all the time. You know, another one that happens to me, I, I, I feel I get depleted because I don't pay attention to my own self-care. I know that I shouldn't be saying that out loud, but I don't. You know, I, am, um, I, am a, um, I have caregiving responsibilities for, for my husband. Um, and um, it's, you'd think it's six and a half years now since, since his stroke. You'd think we would have figured it out. We're still figuring it out. And, I, and uh, this is my most common one, you know, that I, I give and give and give and, and take care of without remembering that, oh, I have to fill. And so then I quickly, for me, I end up as, as your lump, in your lump place. I end up in the, in, the, in the hopeless give up, just go through the motions. And, you know, if anybody else is a caregiver out here, I'm sure many, many people are, you don't do a good job of being a caregiver from a place of just going through the motions because you can't bring kindness Right? You have to have ventral to be in kindness. And so that for me is when I know when I get to that place where I'm going through the motions that, oh, I need to do something because that's not, that's not who I want to be in this, in this relationship. I need to bring kindness. So those are the two, saying yes to too many things in my work world and not paying attention to nourishing myself in my um, personal world. And, and hap still happens to me all the time, still learning. Yeah. And interesting when you find yourself dysregulated that you said, the way that you come back is through uh, talking to to someone that you have a caring yeah. connection with. And I know you said, you know, the only real technical terms I put in the book anchored were autonomic hierarchy, neuroception, but there was a third, uh, which is co-regulation. Yes. And I yeah. think <laughs> it's an important core part of the polyvagal theory that's worth talking about. You say and write, co-regulation is a biological imperative. So I wonder if you can explain that. Yes, and, and I, that, that, that's, you know, Steve used those, Steve Burgess used those words, biological imperative. It's, it's the scientific way of saying that if we don't have someone to co-regulate with, we don't survive. Right? And we come into the world, we have to have another human to co-regulate with. We can't survive on our own. And that, that goes on for a long period of time, the basic survival. But in fact, for the course of our lifetime, we do not experience you know, well-being um, unless we have people in our life that we can co-regulate with, right? that we can connect with, we have reciprocal relationships with. You know, and so, yes, co-regulation is that third principle of polyvagal theory that I think is so important and I think is so challenging for us. I think understanding neuroception and hierarchy and being able to know where I am and do things to come back are, are far easier for me than the co-regulating piece because, you know, as, as for, for many people, um, people have not always been kind and safe people to be around, right? And so when that's our experience, we we have to build trust again. We have to be, be able to reach out and go, ooh, you know, is this a relationship that can, that I can actually say, you know, I, I'm feeling dysregulated and have somebody meet me in the way that my nervous system wants. And that's the key to, to connecting with another person. You know, if, if, if you, you know, reach out to me and say, you know, here's what's going on for me, I don't think you're asking me to problem solve, right? You're, you're asking me to, to, to be with you, to, to hear, to witness, to listen in that deep way, because that then allows you to feel heard and held, which will bring ventral and from ventral, you're going to figure it out or we can figure it out together. But so that's the co-regulating piece. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for social um, connection, you know, in our lives, in, in, with people who feel safe and trustworthy and can be trusted and with whom we can create a connection where we can say, here's what I need from you. Right. And that's really the key is to be able to say, you know, here's what I need or have have the person that I'm, you know, sending this message to simply say, I hear you. You know, what, what how can I help? What, what would help? Mm -hmm. Right. 
and, and sort of getting out of their own way to simply say, here I am. They're extending their ventral connection to me in a way that's so helpful because I've lost connection to my own. Right. You know, yeah. it, interestingly, I just I want to share this uh, briefly, mm -hmm. which is a friend of mine said uh, the other night when he and his wife were out to dinner uh, with me and my partner, you know, I find being around you so regulating. And I said, to, why? Why? We're like, we're all messed up. Like, what do you mean we're regulating? And he's like, oh, it's not. It's just because you care about me. And I was like, it's that simple. All I have to do is care about you and you're going to feel more regulated. Like, I can do that. I do care about you. So I thought that was so interesting to your point that we regulate each other through our love and care, not necessarily because like we have it all together or something no, like that. Right. Yeah, probably because we don't have it all together because I can show up for somebody else who's dysregulated because I know that experience intimately myself. Right. I mean, that's what that's what makes us all human. The, the, I say somewhere that the nervous system is the common denominator in human experience. Right. And that's what that's what can bring us all together. I, I you know, I I know my nervous system and it dysregulates with the best of them. And so I can, you know, certainly be with you and 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 listen and be with and, and not not judge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, yeah. You have a, a quote, we need to feel safe in the arms of another. Mm -hmm. That is our nervous system's longing. Yeah. I thought that was so interesting. Mm -hmm. So what is it that, I mean, our nervous system, it's almost like this part of us that operates. It's like I got, there's there's me and my nervous system, but my nervous system has its own longing. It That's yeah. what, can you explain that? Yeah, and that, that really is that, again, that, that sense of, you know, physical and emotional well-being can only happen when we are safely connected with others and not simply, you know, across the miles, but we really do long to, to be physically in contact with others. You know, and I, I know, you know, so many people have suffered with that over the um, course of this pandemic, the inability to, to, to touch. Right. We are touch starved in this way. But and, you know, the research on touch is, is fascinating. We really do need touch, you know, and it is your nervous systems, you know, reaching out with a longing to to be, you know, in physical proximity with other nervous systems, with other humans. You know, you, we talk about regulating. I love that, that your, your friend said, you know, just by being around you, what they're what they're saying is your ventral regulation is 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 being felt and so their nervous system feels safe and welcomed and begins to to regulate that's the power of ventral to ripple out into the world and touch other nervous systems just by being you know in in that place which i think is is quite amazing i think that's that's something that that um really inspires me to to you know want to find my own regulation my own ventral you know, because I know that as I do this, I am, you know, able to then, you know, send that out to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Deb, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is that you're an expert in translating polyvagal theory for general humans like me, but also in terms of working with therapists and helping them in their work with people who have suffered from trauma. And I wonder if you could Give us, you know, as they say, the kind of the 411, if you will, of how this conversation we've been having about polyvagal theory in general applies for therapists who are working with people who have trauma. Yeah, you know, the, the fascinating part of my work training clinicians is um, we clinicians always want to know the, the, the protocol, the process, the steps to doing this thing. And you know, with with polyvagal theory, the, the the process is really you have to know your own nervous system first, right? Your responsibility, if you, you know, as a therapist, your responsibility is to be regulated so that you can be regulating for your client, right? And so, if you don't know your nervous system, and if you aren't able to to stay anchored and come back to that regulated place in your work with clients then you become a, a, a threat to their system. You send off a warning, which another system is going to receive, kind of like you were talking about. You had the, you know, if you had a, a 
time with a friend and you thought after that felt dangerous. That's what happens in clinical work when we therapists um, don't stay fully anchored and curious and, and, and wanting to be in that place with our clients. The client gets that and they feel that that um, that cue of danger that that comes at them. So that's the, that's where we start. And um, so it's a it's a personal learning process with with that therapists in order to 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 understand their own system. And then what I say is anything you're going to use with your clients, any skill, any practice, you have to have done it for yourself first. Right. So all of the, the different practices that are in my clinical clinical work, um, you know, you, you find you find a partner and you try it with each other first. Right. See what happens. See, see, see where it takes you. So, you know, in a lot of ways, clinic, clinical work and and, you know, I think I say that, you know, it's our responsibility as, as clinicians. I think it's also our responsibility as, as parents, as partners, as colleagues, you know, as friends. You know, to, to be responsible for our own nervous system and for, you know, either regulating when we can, um, knowing when we've been dysregulated, coming back and, and making a repair, right? Because again, none of us are regulated all the time. Ruptures happen all the time and we come back and we make a repair. And that that that's important, right? So, yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you about people who ha are feeling a surge of anxiety in the pandemic, especially, and are listening to this conversation and saying, you know, truth be told, I'm anxious a lot of the time. I'm not sleeping well. My uh, anchor to ventral feels thin, like the anchor feels thin. What would you suggest specifically to someone in that situation? Yeah, and 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 first I would say not uncommon. You're not alone, right? I think if we look at our world right now in in in, in the global community, we see great groups of people who are feeling that anxiety, and then we see another great group of people who are feeling the the disconnect, the the the, the shutdown. You know, so if we talk about the people who are feeling the, the anxiety, I love how you say that the anchor's thin, still there, but thin, still holding on, but thin. You know, again, I, I would invite you, I think a couple of things are really important. One is to figure out what can you do on your own that feels as though you are um, um, releasing some of that anxiety so that you are you are bringing in something that feels um, safe, something that feels um, connecting, right? So, so something on your own, because we need things to do on our own and then things to do with others, right? So some of the things that I've been suggesting recently are um, to, to um, music, right? Because music is such a... a, a lovely way of, of both regulating and being with anxiety, anger, despair in a way that is um, helpful. It, they, they call it the paradoxical effect of music so that, you know, think of a, think of a song that, that brings you to that place of, of, of such anxiety. And yet when you're with that song or those lyrics you sing along and you feel like oh yeah somebody's in that anxiety with me so music has been a really lovely way that people have been finding to to um be with their anxiety in a way that then makes it feel less overwhelming right because sometimes it's not about getting away from or out of it's learning how to be with in a different way Right, so music can help us do that. Um, getting, either getting out into nature or um, looking at um, images of nature, right? Because nature is a, a pretty predictable um, activator of some of this ventral experience. Um, you know, certain. You know, if you have a certain um, uh, movement that you do, all these practices that that again, things that you can do that are small simple and easy. Don't take up a lot of time. I think that's been the, the one of the keys is that people have been bombarded by, you know, the five things to do to 
to feel better or the six things that will reduce your anxiety. And, and I had that experience in the beginning. And it's like, well, none of those work for me. So what's wrong with me? So what I'd like to invite people to do is, you know, think, well, what, what would you suggest if you were going to say, here are three things, what would you say? Because that's your nervous system saying, here's what works for your nervous system and make them things that are simple and easy. Because when we're in this unrelenting pandemic and with anxiety or with that collapse, we don't have a lot of energy to do long practices. So easy things. You know, things that are easy to reach for, easy to do. And then if you can, find one or two other people who can be trusted um, allies with you, who, who you know, are, are going to, you know, understand your suffering and are going to share their suffering with you, right? It's, this is about community and finding community in, in new ways. So, again, it, it's, it, it's listening to your nervous system. Your nervous system's talking to you. Right. And even if you don't speak the, the, the language that we have in, in the book, you can listen to your nervous system. And if you just took a moment and just kind of kind of said, OK, nervous system, I'm going to listen to you right now. I don't even know how to do this, but I'm going to just be still for a moment. I'm going to listen. What do you want me to know? Your nervous system is going to talk to you. It's quite amazing. Right. You're going to hear something. And then from what you hear. That will lead you to, oh, okay, I wonder what I wonder what I might do with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Deb, we've been talking about the potential to shape our nervous system, to become an active operator of our nervous system. And one of the questions that comes up for me is how much was my nervous system formed early in my life? Like I'm still even at whatever age, 50, 60, working out how my nervous system was formed during the first five years of my life. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Your, your nervous system is shaped in, in, in the fetal environment, even by your, by your mother's um, experience. You know, we have research on anxiety and depression and how that gets, uh, how that impacts the, the unborn child. Right. And then how you're met when you enter the world. Were you met in the arms of a loving other or, or not? And then what your experience is. Did you grow up in a family where, you know, you were welcomed and celebrated just the way you were? Or did you grow up in a family where, you know, you got the message, you don't be that, don't be that, right? And, and what these things do is your nervous system takes that in and begins to under, understand, you know, if we can say it in that way, you know, either, you know, it, which survival response is going to help you survive, right? In, in my family, my survival response, I went to dorsal, fly under the radar, be invisible. That was my early experience. And, it, and you know, it certainly lingers with me to this day, although it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, hijack me the way it did when I was a kid because I have lots of other skills, you know, and perhaps yours went there or perhaps yours went to the sympathetic, you know, acting out, being big, running away, getting attention, right, or trying to manage the world because it felt that was the only thing to do. This is how our nervous systems help us survive our childhoods. And yet, you know, the, the lovely thing is, you know, as we grow and we begin to create different um relationships and, and form different communities and change our environments, our nervous systems are then being shaped by those new experiences. So, you know, in some ways, you know, like you, it's, it's interesting to go back and, and reflect on and think, how is it shaped? And for me, I'm, I'm, um, what am I? I'm, <laughs> I'm 68. <laughs> had to think for a minute, 68. And, you know, there, there's, I think I've come to peace with um, that early experience because now for me, it's really about how do, how do I want to, you know, partner with my nervous system now to shape my world now and to, to shape, you know, the world of my children and grandchildren. So, you know, at some point, you know, we reach that place and go, okay, I understand. And if I look back and we all want to look back, you might think about your parents or caregivers, whoever you had, you know, caring for you growing up and look at their nervous systems, 
right? Because their nervous systems were were what was running the show for them and, and making them act in certain ways, that their biology was doing that. I grew up in a house with, you know, two, with, you know, a brother who was sympathetically huge acting out and two adults who were both very dorsal reserved, right? And so it's interesting for me to, to instead of thinking about all the ways I could give story to who they were, and why didn't they do this? But to look at their nervous system and say, oh, now I get it, right? Because that's what their nervous system supported them in doing, right? They didn't have the capacity to come to this place of ventral and, 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 and offer what I would have wanted, right? So it's helpful for me to look back and say, oh, I get it now. That was their nervous system. So that's, that's one of the things that I think is helpful. A nervous system biography, if you yeah. will. yeah. 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 Now, one of the things I read in Anchored that I thought was so interesting was that when we're in these protective states of sympathetic fight or flight or uh, dorsal collapse, that's when we're also uh, in self-criticism and blame. And that in order to be in a state of self-compassion, we actually have to get our anchor back. Exactly. And, and I wonder if you can ex explain that. And does practicing self-compassion, is that actually a method for reestablishing more ventral regulation? Yes. I don't know if I, am, how am I, yeah. how, how am I talking the talk now? You are, you, That's are, right. you are doing it. You are becoming fluent. I love it. <laughs> yes. And yes, to, to both of those, compassion is, a, is what we call an emergent property of ventral. It's something that, that, that emerges, arises when you are in a ventral state, you know, and there's, there's beautiful research on, on that um, around on compassion. Dr. Keltner's work out of the Greater Good Science Center, right, talks about compassion and vagal activity. So it's really lovely to think that your biology is the basis of compassion, right? And it also means that, as you said, when we're in a survival state, we don't have access to compassion or self-compassion. And compassion practices, self-compassion practices especially, help us, you know, have a stronger anchor and help us come back to that to that place. You know, in, in um, Kristen Neff and Chris Germer's beautiful self-compassion practice, you know, that three-step self-compassion practice that, that, that brings awareness to, you know, this is a moment of suffering, suffering's common, may I be kind, you know, and, and I, you know, took those and rewrote those for the nervous system and say, so, you know, oh, this is a moment of dysregulation and just acknowledging that, you know, and oh, everybody dysregulates sometimes. And then, oh, may, you know, may I find my way back to my anchor you know that for me that simple practice then brings me back because it brings that recognition oh right dysregulated everybody does i know the way back and it, and i come back quicker and i stay there longer that's the practice right so any of these practices are going to you know increase your capacity to be in ventral and help you come back more quickly which is really what we're wanting to do yeah Mm -hmm. Now, you, you write that sometimes the vagus nerve is actually called the compassion nerve. Can you just make that explicit, why the nerve itself is sometimes called the compassion nerve? Yeah, you know, and it's, it's, it, it's fascinating that, um, you know, we, we name nerves in this way. I was kind of fascinating that we talk about the nervous system in this way. Uh, you know, you were saying, oh, my nervous system and me, right? You know, it's, it's a part of, of our biology, and yet we... we you know, have brought it alive in this way, which I really do, do love. And we call it the compassion nerve as, as a reminder that it is this ventral vagal pathway of, of this nerve that brings the capacity for compassion, right? That, 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 that is where it's located, right? And, and when that ventral vagal pathway is, 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 you know, um, active, alive, um, when we're anchored there, have a strong enough anchor there. You know, we don't have to be fully immersed in ventral in order to feel our anchor there. But when we have a critical mass of ventral, then we can see see another with compassion, right? Well, if I can be anchored in my ventral, I can look at this other person who is, you know, who is totally dysregulated. And rather than thinking up a story about who they are, 
from that behavior they're doing, I can look and go, oh, dysregulated. What does that nervous system need to feel a bit more safe in this moment? That's compassion in action for me. Mm -hmm. Now, Deb, let me ask you what's maybe a little bit of an odd question. Let's say someone's listening to this and they're not very scientifically oriented. And they say, you know, okay, is it worth it for me to put all this energy in to understand the basic polyvagal theory, to understand more about my nervous system? Or isn't it just okay? I kind of know what makes me feel like sane and whole and reasonable and good. Can't I just do that? Like, is there really any reason to bother to learn the basics of polyvagal theory? How does it help us? If we didn't learn it, we'd be really missing out. You know, I would say yes, if we don't learn it, we're, we're missing out on important information that that um, is available to us. I think if, if you think, oh, I know, I, I know how to, how to, you know, ground myself, how to, how to, you know, feel okay in the world. But to me, that's, that's a, that's not, I, I want to invite you to go deeper. I truly want to invite you to understand how this system that, that is inside you works so that you really can, can, can fully appreciate both the, the adaptive survival energies and the regulating energies and so that you you can look you can reflect on an experience with compassion with self-compassion instead of going to that sif critical you know why why do i always do this place right we understand that when we understand how this system works, we understand, oh, this is the pattern of protection that has been wired in. And because I know how the system works, I can shape a pattern of connection instead. These, I think, are the benefits that we get from really understanding our human biology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Deb, I'd love if you could just share with us why you decided to call your new book anchored and use this metaphor of an anchor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it anchored, anchoring and being anchored in are, are words I use all the time. So then when we were looking for a title for the book, um, it just sort of came anchored. And I'll tell you, you know, my own personal history. I'm, I'm, I'm a Mainer, born and bred, many generations Mainer, and I grew up in the water, on the water, around the water. And anchors are incredibly important pieces of equipment when you are on a boat, on the water. And the thing I love about an anchor and what I hope really comes alive in this book is that an anchor is dug deeply into the, the ocean floor. And so it holds you safely in that place. And between the anchor and the boat is, is what's called anchor road, which is the line that, that holds it. And you let out enough line so that you can move, so that you're not just held in this one tiny place with your anchor. You can move around the anchor. And there's this lovely swaying and rhythm that happens. And, and for me, that's the experience of, of anchoring in ventral, is that it, when I'm anchored there, I then have the ability to to move around, to, to dip into sympathetic, to dip into dorsal, knowing that I can come back and be held in that anchor of ventral. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, uh, talking to you is a delight. It's a co-regulating delight. So uh, thank you so very much. It is exactly that for me as well. I, I just have, have loved this. And my understanding of the nervous system and polyvagal theory increases every time we talk. So thank well, you. You are a member of the polyvagal family and you are speaking the language now. So thank you. I've been speaking with Deb Dana with Sounds True. She's created an original audio series, Befriending Your Nervous System, that then grew into a new book. And that book is called Anchored, How to Befriend Your Nervous System Using Polyvagal Theory. Deb Dana is also a featured teacher in a new program from Sounds True that's called the Healing Trauma Certificate Program, a nine-month training to regulate your nervous system, embody safety, and become a healing presence. You can learn more at SoundsTrue.com. Thank you for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at SoundsTrue.com 
forward slash podcast. And if you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I love getting your feedback, being in connection with you, and learning how we can continue to evolve and improve our program. Working together, I believe, we can create a kinder and wiser world. Soundstrue.com, waking up the world.